ministering about salvation, you should minister about it with a new passion. Even if you're t just talking one-on-one, -on -one, you know? And I, cause I can't, I can't um, imagine the apostles just having a nonchalant attitude about salvation. Those men were into it. Remember P Peter on the day of Pentecost? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he taught Jesus with some passion. Yeah. He taught it with passion so much so to men ask, what must we do? We want this. We, we want this Jesus that you just told us we crucified. We still want him. Amen. Why? Because of what Jesus had done in his life. Because now Peter had something to judge it by. He knew the man he was before Jesus saved him. Now I know the man I am after he has come. My eyes have been opened. And I really see now what Jesus, you remember when Jesus collected the disciples, they walked with him those three and a half years, and they didn't really understand, you know, the totality of Jesus and what he would do. But remember when Jesus was about to go back in Acts, they were still looking for him to set up that earthly kingdom. Say, well, are you going to restore the kingdom now to us? And Jesus, you know, say, look, don't worry about that. When, 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 when I come, I'm going to give you power when the Holy Spirit comes. So Jesus knew the power of salvation. And he knew that once he got inside those men, you're not going to be worried about Rome or nobody else. <laughs> he knew that. So Jesus wasn't perturbed that he's about to go back and these guys still don't, don't have it. You know, No, he was not disturbed. He was not moved. And when, when, when Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Peter went out there and preached with such passion, with such fervency. I mean, he, he taught salvation. He taught Jesus. And 3,000 souls, that's how we, we got to have that same passion. Whether you're talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, whether you're in the grocery store, I don't care where you're at, or whether you're in the pulpit, Amen. Once we grab a hold to what Jesus has really done in us and has really done for us, we have escaped the corruption in this world. We have escaped it by way of salvation. Amen. We've escaped it. So I want us to be passionate about what God has done. Amen. So he's saw fit to really come back around again and really break down this new man. Amen. And really show us what he did. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Banks got a question. <laughs> yes. Um, my question is, sorry. My question is, during the time that Jesus was here, mm -hmm. he, he ministered. Now, he ministered from... You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He ministered, but he ministered continuously and repetitively the kingdom. Mm -hmm. The kingdom. Mm -hmm. And even when Nicodemus came to him, he, he, he said, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my question is this. In, 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 with regard to... to Jesus ministering the kingdom how do how do you how do you now reconcile because remember the teaching says that what what G, everything Jesus preached mm -hmm. the disciples just gave us more details mm -hmm. you know he set the foundation they didn't preach anything that he didn't preach they just gave us more details mm -hmm. so how do you how does the the message of the kingdom now mm -hmm. relate to the message of salvation or the mystery of godliness. Mm -hmm. Can you see the, can you see that relationship now? The, you know, the th message of the kingdom. Right. That Jesus constantly, the kingdom is this, the kingdom of heaven is that, the mm -hmm. kingdom, the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then he, at the end, he said, the kingdom got to be preached in every nation mm -hmm. before the end comes. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God got to be preached in every nation, mm -hmm. you know, and you just hit on something. You said they were waiting to, for a literal kingdom to be set up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Even even when he got ready to leave, wait a minute, are you going to restore the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And you said something. You said, 
once Jesus get in you, you won't even worry about the Roman government or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how do you put that together? That's what God mm-hmm. want us as ministers to to see that big picture. Okay. You you know to mm-hmm. see that big picture how Jesus was how 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 oh how Jesus was 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 um ministering the gospel of the kingdom and now salvation produces the kingdom Mm -hmm. see see so that when we go back and study when we're studying the the gospels the four gospels Mm -hmm. that's where jesus introduced himself that's where jesus introduced the kingdom but now in acts and 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 the epistles we have become the kingdom you know, we, we, he produced the kingdom when on Pentecost, the kingdom was produced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you see, Mm -hmm. and and I want you to see that Mm -hmm. with the salvation message. Okay. Because now what is, what is the kingdom? the, The kingdom that, that, that you just said that they were waiting for was a literal kingdom. So what is a literal kingdom? A literal kingdom has a king and it has all these subjects, you know, all these, these people, that serving the king. Mm-hmm. So what is salvation? Salvation is a kingdom. It's the kingdom of God manifested in the earth. But what is that kingdom? You know, wh- what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Nic- J- Jesus said to him, he says, except you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom. Jesus was alluding to the fact that I'm standing right here in front of you. I am the kingdom of God and you don't even know it. You can't even see it. You can't see it because it doesn't come with observation. It's, it's not like, you know, it's not, it's, it's like the wind. Okay, the kingdom of God came without observation. What was that? The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost came and got in a man. But now, what does the new man teach? The new man teaches that we are not only one spirit, but we're one what? Flesh. We're one flesh as well. So, so now you take all of these people, let's say, if all of us in here represented 10,000 people, one of us, each one of us represented a million people. Each one of us represented a million. So we kind of, all of them, we got all these millions of Christians. They're one flesh. They're, they're, they're one. They're one body. And it's the body of Christ. So it's his body. All of us make up his body, his bone, his flesh. That's what we are. We're one flesh and we're one spirit. So that's the kingdom. When you look at the church, the church now is the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. And notice what he said about that kingdom. Each one of us as members of that kingdom, he says, your citizenship is in heaven. That you're citizens of New Jerusalem. Your name is written in New Jerusalem as citizens of New Jerusalem. Even though you're in the world, you're not of the world. But, but a- in the world, we're, we, we're here as one body. That's the kingdom manifested. That's just like, that's just like Nic- you're, you're Jesus and I'm Nicodemus and we're standing before each other and Jesus saying, except you be born again, you can't even see that I am the kingdom. You, you know? And so now as we, as, as saints of God, the world is looking at us and they can't even see we are the kingdom of God. We're it. We're the kingdom manifested. Walking the earth again. And, and that, that's what I want us to see when we read the Gospels now. We got to read the Gospels as Jesus was preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom. We got to see it manifested in the formation of the church. As opposed to the literal kingdom that's coming in the millennium. You know, that's, that's, that's the literal setup of the kingdom in the millennium. The government of Jesus coming to the earth and and you know he ruling from Jerusalem. But what about now? Where is the ki- gospel of the kingdom must be preached? What is he? What is he saying? What is he He's saying? talking about the mystery of godliness. That's the gospel of the kingdom. See, and that's what we don't preach. We don't. We we preach the door. Jesus is the door to the kingdom. But what is the kingdom of God on the earth? What is the kingdom of God on the earth? The ki- right now. We know it, what it's going to be in the millennium. But what is that kingdom right now? You know, Jesus walking around and he and, and, and then Nicodemus come over and, and Nicodemus say, well, you know, we know you're a man sent from God. 
And um, <laughs> you know, <geez. laughs> things never change. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> and Nicodemus, he, 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 you know, said, "We know you, your man sent from God." But Jesus, Jesus said, "Except you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. You can't even see the kingdom of God." If you were born again, you'd know who I am. And just like when, 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 when Lazarus died, when Lazarus died and, and, and Mary said, if, 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 if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus said, well, you know, he'll live again. And she said, yeah, I know he'll, he'll live in the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. Now, this is what I want us to, Tanya said something the other day, I don't even, I can't say it the way she said it, but it's, it's so real, it's got to be applicable across the board. When God says something, don't try to define it with your own little mind. Your little mind can't define what God is trying to say. When God is saying something, he has to reveal it. You can't, you can't figure out what God means, you know, by thinking. You know, you're going to figure it out. You can't figure it out. God has to reveal what he means. Now, if Jesus said to Nicodemus, you can't, if you, unless you're born again, you can't, you can't see the kingdom. And if Jesus said to Mary, I am the resurrection. And then way over here in John, he says, as he is, so are we. What part of as he is, so are we that we're not? What tenure, during his tenure here on earth, his makeup, his existence, what part of his existence, what part of his existence we are not? What am I trying to say? What is my point? My point is, if he said, as he is, so are we, he meant that. He meant that as Jesus is, so are we now. Right now. And that means that in every aspect of who Jesus is, we are. So when Jesus walked the earth, he can't be any different. He could not have been any different than we are right now. Then the Bible would not be true. And the mystery of godliness would be a fake, be a fraud. See, we can't be afraid of that. Because, see, the church is afraid of becoming as he is. The church is afraid of saying that they are as he is. The church is already afraid of that. That sounds like heresy. People think that that's, you, you know, that you're, that you're off on the deep end when you say that as Jesus is, so are we. They think that you don't, you don't, you know, you're off your rocker somewhere. But well, we cannot be afraid to identify with Jesus in every aspect of his identity because he is the new man. He's the, the second Adam. He's the new man in whom we live now. He is that new man. And that new man that's walking the earth now in, in Rachel's body, that new man that's walking the earth in Tanya's body or in Blaze's body is no different than he was in Jesus' body. The same man. He's the same man. 
So every aspect of who Jesus was or is, so are we. And we must keep that before us. Otherwise, otherwise, it will be totally unfair for God to expect us to be holy. It would, it would be unfair if Jesus has some advantage that we don't have. Now, I got another question for you. As it relates to Jesus having an advantage that we don't have, why doesn't he have an advantage that we don't have? Why is it not, tr why is it not true if someone says Jesus had an advantage that we don't ha that we don't have he had an advantage over us he could you know that's why uh he could be he he's the son of god and he could be, he was holy and he never sinned he couldn't he couldn't sin he couldn't commit sin so he has an advantage why is that not true why does jesus did why is it tr is it not true when people say Jesus had an advantage that we don't have. Why is that not true? Anyone? Who wants to answer that? You just answered it for us, really. Uh huh. You said, as he is, so are we. Uh huh. Right, so that's what I said. Mm -hmm. Everything that he is, that's what we are. Okay, that is absolutely true. That's the correct answer. Now, what I want you to tell me is why, from the perspective of defining a new man. From salvation. From when you when you just when you in in the salvation, when you if you're gonna teach salvation, and you got in you and you you teach the new man, show it to me from that perspective. Why is that not true? Right. When you got to talk about the new man. Oh, this brother back right here says he, he. Because just as he didn't, he didn't have the spirit of sin and darkness within him. We don't have that within us either. So we're the same. That's why he didn't have an advantage. And that's just the truth. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, it's gone. It's because of the circumcision of the flesh, and and. No law of sin and death operating within him. What's your name? That's Ed. No, that's not the other Ed, the tall. Oh, that's another Ed. Okay, praise you, Jesus. I'm going to say, did I miss something? <laughs> okay. That is so true. What he said is so true because there is no law of sin and death working in, inside of this body, just as there was none in, inside of his body. Right? See, see, that's the thing that defines the gospel. When, this, when, the, when, the, when the, the, the gospel, the word gospel means good news. That is the good news. That's it. That we have been made free from sin. That's the whole, that was the whole essence of of, of Jesus coming to free us from sin. We, we have overcome sin because we've been made free from it. We're free from sin. We don't have to sin anymore. There's nothing that will force us to sin. That was the good news. That's what the gospel means. Good news. That's the good news that we have been. We're no longer captives. Held captives to sin. Anyone else? Any question? So you understand, as he is, so are we. Then tell me what is the responsibility of the soul now that he's saved? What is the responsibility of the soul now that he's saved? 
Marlene. Darlene. Uh, this re the responsibility of the soul would be to allow Jesus to do whatever he wants to do inside the vessel and not usurp any authority over the vessel now that has been one with God. Right. What is his responsibility? What is his profession now? What does he do? To reconcile souls back to God. He's given us the minister of reconciliation. Right. And how does he do it? By being a witness? Yes. Yes. All right. All right, Miss Miss Darling. <laughs> All right. Explain to me a witness. Someone explain a witness. What does a witness do? How does he witness? What does it mean to be a witness? To observe an event. That's a very good answer. To observe an event. A witness is one that observes an event. What is the event that the soul observes? What is it? I heard it. Huh? What does he observe? What is the whole, what is it that the soul is bearing witness of? What? I heard somebody say it. Yes, salvation. He observes salvation. What did he see? If he observed it, what was he looking at? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. Well, witnessing would be the same thing. You can testify to an, an event that happened. The event that happened would be salvation. Uh -huh. And in salvation now is, what you said, the circumcision of mm -hmm. the flesh mm -hmm. and that spirit of iniquity. And then we're placed in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So now we, I guess, are one with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so he testifies of that. Who does he testify to? The rest of the other people either. I mean, you could still testify in the body of Christ because not everyone is, you know, up to par. Mm -hmm. Or everybody else, <laughs> secular people, the world, anybody the world. who needs salvation. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Praise the Lord. Which one are you now? I get all y'all confused. I am the last This is Mary, girl. the last, the youngest, youngest girl. Mary. See y'all you look alike. Oh you, you baptized me. <laughs> I know, I know, but you don't you've grown up. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> oh. And all of you, you know, it's 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 not um always true that it, uh, you know, all the kids in the family look pretty. All of them look good. All of you guys, all of you grew up looking really nice, really pretty pretty girls and I, I'm looking at from one to the other like who is who now <laughs> praise you Jesus amen all right so the witness the soul is a witness now he's a witness to what has happened to whom to him to himself so so the, when you to when you when you are witness as to what happened to you what is that called what is it called? What? What? A who? I heard somebody say it. A testimony. That's a testimony. When you bear witness of what has happened to you, that's a testimony. That's a testimony. So what is the... Is there a difference? If, what is, if there is a difference, what is the difference between a witness and an ambassador. What would be the difference between being a witness of Christ and being an ambassador of Christ, if there is any difference? Yes, ma'am. 
I think it's the same because an ambassador is what goes in the place of someone. Mm -hmm. So I think they are the same, and that's what we are. We stands in Christ's stead, and that's what an ambassador do. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Why would we be called ambassadors, though? Because her, her answer is absolutely correct. But well, why would we be called ambassadors if Christ is the new man? Because we are, we are one with Christ. We are one with Christ. So what is it that, uh, in, the, in the natural sense, what does an ambassador have that a witness may not have? Authority. Authority. When, you, when, when, when the, our country sends an ambassador, he has the authority of the president. He has, the, he has all the Congress behind him. He got the president behind him. He got the judicial system behind him. He got the whole country behind him. He has power. He has power. He has, he has the authority of the one he represents. However, I still want to know if Jesus is the new man that lives in this flesh, why would we be called ambassadors? Other than the fact that she said we're one with Christ. That's true. That's the foundation. You got to go from that, from the fact that we're one with Christ. But I'm trying to get you to see why they use certain terms. Because he says we are witnesses and he says we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors of Christ. The reason I want to go here is because I don't want us to see a separation. Because, to, to, because when you think of an ambassador when you th from, the, from our government. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, I would say that we have, we have all the God-given power that Jesus had to do anything and everything. Like you say, greater works will we do. We have that power as ambassadors. And that, uh, after, the bo after we're born again and we have the spirit and we're one with that, we have that same power. We have the same power. Yeah. <laughs> my question, what was my question? <laughs> What's the, if there be any difference, if there be a difference, why, what's the difference between being an ambassador of Christ and being a witness for Christ? If there is a difference, what would be the difference? Now, Sister Tompkins says she don't see that there is a difference because we're one with Christ. Okay. So I saw somebody. Okay, right here. Um, I would say there is no difference because just like Christ came down and he was God's ambassador, we are ambassadors now. We were, we're seated in heavenly places. That's what, we, what happened in the new man. And now we're his ambassador. We're in a foreign land, the, the world. That's it right there. That's, what I was, that's one phase that I'm looking That's one thing that I'm, I'm listening for. We're in a foreign land. That's why we're called ambassadors. More so than there being a difference of being a witness and an ambassador, the ambassador is always in a foreign land, not in his own country. That's the difference. Not in, you know, because we got the same power. Just like she said, we're one with Christ. 
but we're in a foreign land. That's why we're called ambassadors. We're in a foreign land. The reason why you got to stick with that definition is because in the natural, when you think of an ambassador in the natural, he goes to a foreign country to represent the president, right? He's, but he's right. He's still got to abide by the American law. If we, I'm sorry. Right. He he's he. But when he goes into another country as an ambassador, right, he has to he has to be subject to the laws of that country. I know he he still I know what you're saying, but I, I'm bringing on another issue here. That's another difference. The, the, the power of God supersedes everything the world got. Everything the world, all of the powers that be. God, can, God has, the, has the ability to usurp the powers that be. For instance, um, um, even though this was Old Testament, it was still the operation of the Holy Ghost. When Ahab, when 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 Ahab was king, and Elijah walks into the to the palace, and says, "Okay, you guys say I'm the I'm the I'm the problem in Israel. Well, if I'm the problem, then it's not going to rain for the next three years." And turn around and walk out. <laughs> duh, duh. He who is he represent? God. He was speaking for God. And he's defying all natural laws. And he's, and he's talking to the king, and the king can't do anything about what he said. The king can't change it. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So that's, the, that's a difference, too, that, that we have the, that God's power supersedes all power. All power. But, one of the, but the difference that I was looking for is that we're in a foreign land. That's why we're called ambassadors. Because we're in a foreign land. We're, we're in, not in our own country. Amen? Now, because we're not in our own country, what did the scripture tell us? What mindset are we supposed to have while we're here? Pilgrims. That begins to make sense now, doesn't it? It begins, to, it? it begins to make sense why God would call us pilgrims. He said we're pilgrims just passing through. Passing through this. Now, notice what it also says about pilgrims. Remember the teachings of Christ. It said, do, do not store up treasures here for the moth and canker worm to destroy. But set your treasures where? In heaven. Because that's where your citizenship is. Isn't that right? Set your treasure there, and then someone else told us to set our what there? Affections. So the things that we're supposed to love. Now, notice what the scripture says in Romans. The scripture tell us, uh, this, this is something I want us to, to, to really take note of. Look in Romans, I think it's the fifth chapter. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's Romans 5. <clears throat> Um, might be um, did I say Romans yeah yeah. <laughs> there's a scripture what is the scripture that says to be carnally minded is death that's Romans 8 Yes, Romans 8. Look at Romans 8 and let's read from the third verse. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sin for flesh and for sin did what? What does condemn mean? 
destroyed it. Look at the fourth verse. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? So righteousness is supposed to be fulfilled in the saints of God, right? Who walk not after the flesh, but what? Now, this is something I want us to see here. When it says, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. After the spirit means the same thing as those that are led by the spirit are the sons of God. When it says we walk not after the spirit, there's two things I want you to, two definitions I want you to get out of that. When you see walking after the spirit or walking after the flesh. I want you to think in terms of when I see walking after the spirit, immediately I know that he's talking about those who are led by the Holy Ghost. If I'm led by the Holy Ghost, I'm walking after the spirit, right? Hello? But also, it also means those who walk by the spirit. Now, what's the difference in walking after the Spirit and by the Spirit? That's your question. Yeah, yeah. What, what, do, what do you think? I'm t what do you think? Why do you think I gave you two different definitions here? What would, be, what would you obviously think of when you say walking after the Spirit as opposed to walking by the Spirit? Because that's the part that the church got to get, get a hold of, the walking by the Spirit. You got to understand that as a definition for those who walk after the spirit. They also walk by the spirit. What does that really mean? She says by the word. Who else? What does it mean to walk by the spirit? Think in terms of the salvation experience. Define it from the position of the salvation experience. What happens at salvation? Walking by the Spirit. That's, that's, that's the first definition. To be led by the Spirit. But the second one is walking by the Spirit. What does that really mean? From the salvation experience. Yeah. Walking, this is what I'm saying. Walking after the Spirit has two connotations. One connotation is to be led by the Spirit. And the other one is to walk by the Spirit. What does that mean, Heather? This is just a wild stab, but okay. <laughs> I mean, you're, all right, it's in him I live, move, and have my being. Uh-huh. So I'm, I, the whole reason I'm alive is because of him. He, exactly. I'm in him, right. so it's him moving. Right. Right? If I'm a witness, he's the one that's doing everything. I'm just watching him, right? Uh-huh. So, so what is how, talk to me about walking. Walking would uh, to me walking would be a choice. Right? Walking in the spirit is because I'm choosing to yield to that spirit. Right? Mm, that's what we thought it was. Oh. <laughs> that's true. Okay. It's true that I can choose, but I'm saying this scripture here goes beyond that. Okay. Okay, we got to go to the increase that the scripture is giving us now. You, you said it in the beginning, and then you backed off of it. Because I thought they were two different. I thought walking in the spirit and being led by were two different things, or are they the same? Are they the same thing? Technically, yes, but I want them explained. Oh. <laughs> Blade? <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yes, they're the same thing, but I want them to be explained. I want it to be explained what it means to be led by the Spirit as opposed to walking by the Spirit. And you should get that from salvation. Okay. To be led by the Spirit, that's walking after the Spirit. Okay. But 
The other connotation of that verse, walking out the spirit, means to be to walk by the spirit. Walking after the spirit also means to we to walk by the spirit. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh. oh somebody. Was? Yes, ma'am. Um, oh. To walk by the spirit would be because he brought this body back to life. There you go. That's it. That's it right there. You said it. I know, but I just. Yeah, and, then she, and she said it and backed up. Off. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He brought this body alive. Okay, watch this now. Watch this. This is what he's saying. This is what this is this is what we have not grasped as walking after the spirit. See, notice what he says here. He says he says that the righteousness of the law fourth verse might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that walk for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. In other words, those who have been brought alive by the spirit of God, they mind the things pertaining to the spirit. In other words, if the life that I live now, it is not I that live. It is, it is who? Christ that liveth where? In me. So it's the spirit that has this body alive again. It's the spirit. So I'm walking after the spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm a creature. It's, it's just like saying of the spirit. I'm walking of the spirit. I'm not walking after the flesh. In other words, I'm not in the flesh. Like it says here in Romans, he, on down further, he just gets real plain with it. it. says you are not in the flesh if the spirit of God is in you. So I'm not, a, I'm not of the flesh anymore. I'm of the spirit. So when I, walk, when I say I'm walking by the spirit, it means I'm walking by the Holy Ghost. I'm alive because of the Holy Ghost being in this body. This body is not alive just because I got the breath of life in it. Just because my soul is in it. You understand what I'm saying? That was of the flesh. But now I'm not in the flesh. I'm in the spirit. So my soul is in the spirit. But the spirit of God is what has the body alive. I don't care what happened to this flesh. As long as the Holy Ghost is in this body, it cannot die. The Holy Ghost got to come out of this body before it can die. You can run over it with a tractor. It's still not dying as long as the Holy Ghost is in it. Just why Jesus had to give up the ghost. The Holy Ghost got to come out of this flesh in order for it to die. So this flesh is, is, is walking by the power of the spirit. You, you understand what I'm saying? It's walking by the power of the spirit, not by the power of the flesh, not by the power of the soul being in the flesh. That's, that's, that's what the scripture is also talking about here. Because what he's doing, he says... Those who walk after the flesh as opposed to those who walk after the spirit. He's saying there's some that are not born of God and there's some that are born of God. The ones that are not born of God, they mind the things of the flesh. The ones that are born of God, they mind the things of the spirit. That's what this is really talking about. And then down further around about the ninth verse, he, he just comes right out and said, you are not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. You see, so he's, he's showing you two different people here. He's not, he's not just, just saying, he's not just saying that I am all of this stuff if I choose to walk after the spirit. That's not, that's what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's, he's talking about your state of being. He's not talking about your choice here. He's talking about your state of being. He's also, if you look at the first part of this chapter, it, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do what? Who, who walk not after the flesh, but what? After the spirit. So we always took that to choice. And even though choice is right, I mean, you do have a right to choose whether you're going to walk after the spirit or walk after the flesh. But this scripture is making the distinction between those people who are born of the spirit as opposed to those who are not. 
Okay. Because it's a continuation of the seventh chapter. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. I'm delivered through Jesus. So now, now that I'm delivered through Jesus, there's no condemnation now for those of us who walk after the, the, the spirit and not after the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So I'm walking now by the power of the Holy Ghost. As a saint, we walking by the spirit. Whether, 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 whether you choose to be holy or not, you still walking by the spirit. You are alive because the Holy Ghost is in you. You, you. you know what I'm saying? You are alive because the Holy Ghost is in you. And, and some of us have sinned. Haven't we sinned since we've been saved? Some of us have sinned since we've been saved, but we didn't die. You know why we didn't die? Because the Holy Ghost was still in us. Now, if God ever take that spirit out of us, we're in trouble. If he take that spirit out of us, we're going to, oh, Jesus. Lord, we could die in a minute, in a second. If you take the Holy Ghost out. Yes. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life be because of righteousness. That's exactly it. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's what he's saying. You are alive because of the Holy Ghost. That's your life now. We are one with the Holy Spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is, is one spirit. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm born again. I'm living only because the Holy Spirit. I, I understand that the Holy Spirit being in me is what keeps this body alive. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I was ministering to a sinner, how, I guess my question is, what keeps the sinner alive? Is that you? The breath of life. The br okay. So this is not like this would be in the category of the, because I'm alive because the Holy Ghost. They're alive because of the breath of life. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, Pastor Tony, you looking at me. You, so this is talking about a spiritual death, like because the, there's three deaths, correct? I mean, two. There's two deaths. Spiritually dead and physically dead. How many deaths is it? It's like three, right? <laughs> oh. But you understand what I'm trying to ask? If a, if a sinner was to come up to me right now and say, you said you're alive right now because the Holy Ghost is in your body, but why am I alive? How am I alive? How would I manage that? How would he, he was brought alive the same way Adam was, by the breath of life. Mm -hmm. We breathe the breath of life, but even even if um, if we were in a horrible accident or something where we ought to be dead, if the Holy Ghost is still in that body, it cannot die because the, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of life. Remember what you just read? The Holy Ghost is the spirit of life. Jesus is the spirit of life. You can't kill him. He got to get out of a body in order for that body to die. That's why he told, told those people, you can't take my life. I got to lay it down. So he's in this flesh now. No one can kill this flesh as long as Jesus is in it. He's got to exit it. He's got to give, he's got to give up the ghost. He's got to, we got to give him up. He's got to come out. Any other question? Wow. Tanya, you got any questions? <laughs> Praise, <Jesus. laughs> Praise Lord. So we see now, do we understand now what it means? Amen. That God is not just talking about our choice. Yes, there is a choice. You do have a choice to walk out the spirit or walk out the flesh. Glory to God in the sense of righteousness and unrighteousness, being holy and being unholy. But you are walking because of the Holy Spirit. 
if you're a saint of God. You're, you're alive because of the spirit of God that is in you. Because think about it, a saint actually died. We actually died and were resurrected. According to Romans 6 chapter, we were resurrected in his, in, the, in his resurrection. Just as he was resurrected, so were we. So how were we brought back alive? We were brought back alive by the Spirit of God. So in him we live and move and have our being. Any question? Yes, ma'am. I don't know whether you want to go here or not, but um, uh, and when we were going over this in the Lifesaver Leader meeting, the question came up, and I'd like you to expound on it, um, because the soul was placed back into the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit and the soul were placed back into the body. The question came up about conscience. Where would the conscience fit in that? I, I believe that the conscience... The conscience, the will, the heart. I believe that these, this is part of your spirit, the spiritual man. And I just don't see dissecting them. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, my conscience is a part of who I am, what I am, my soul. You know, it's a part of my soul. I have a, I have a conscience. I have a spirit. I I I see the conscience as so synonymous with the spirit that you know. Um, but I also see it as synonymous with the soul. The reason being because what was on everything was under captivity, and the, and even the conscience. The scripture said the conscience was full of dead works, sin and dead works. That's your soul too. The soul was full of sin and dead works. Uh, so. To to take to take and dissect them, I don't think we're able to. Um, but when God blew into Adam the breath of life, he, he just said he blew a breath of life into him. But now we way over here in the New Testament, we learned that man is body, soul, and spirit. But before in the old covenant, you know, he just blew the breath of life in him. So in that breath of life was soul and spirit. And then in soul and spirit was heart, conscience, mind, spirit of the mind, um, imagination. You, you, you know, that was all his spiritual parts. That's the sp spiritual makeup of, the, of, the, of the, um, the inner man, the inward parts. That's what they, they were called that in the old time, the inward parts. Yeah. Because I think there's a scripture in the Old Covenant that says that God desires righteousness in the inward parts. And so the, what are those inward parts? My imagination, my heart, my, the spirit of my mind, um, uh, my will, all of that God desires, my affections, uh, emotions, all of that God desires righteousness in those parts. Those are spiritual parts. It's called the inner man, which is the soul and spirit. You know, you know, so I think it would take God or the word of God to, to separate them. I, I can't, I, I, I define them all collectively, really. I really do. Yes, ma'am. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, Amen. all your soul, right. all your mind, right. all your strength. He want everything. Everything. So all of this <laughs> got to learn to love the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's that inner man. He got, a, he got the whole inside of you. You got to love the Lord. Amen. Question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Dr. Banks. Um, kind of going where D was at. This word that we are hearing now, is this more for the body of Christ so that we can understand to become more effective witnesses by cutting the sin out of our lives, getting rid of the excuses of why we sinning, to understand what happened to us at salvation? 
or is this message also for the lost? Because I think sometimes what happens is, we, like D saying, we, how do you tell somebody that they're, they're dead, but they're living? Is it more important for us because of, we may try to go give this word to somebody about what all happens to you at salvation and completely lose people. They first need to see, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, why they need salvation. You understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes we try, we get a word like this and we so happy about it and understanding what happened to us, that salvation, and we try to go share it with somebody that don't understand even the need for salvation. So is this message for the body of Christ or is it to be shared with the loss in in the aspect that you're it's being given to us. I don't know if I'm making sense. Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes, I understand exactly what you're asking. Okay. Help me. <laughs> the question would probably be if I was doing a crusade, what would I preach? If I was doing a crusade with sinners, what would I preach? I would preach salvation. I would preach salvation. Um, to me, to me, to preach salvation from this perspective is good for the church and the world. The church ought to already know it. First of all, we should have been taught it from the beginning. They should have told us of this from the beginning. But now that I do know it, I can't wait to do a crusade. Because, see, what, happen, what happens to a lot of people. Okay, let's use Darlene, for instance. When she came in, she didn't get saved right away. But what, 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 what caused her to get saved? She heard the word. She heard the word. And see, we're now looking and teaching in retrospect because supposing we had had these truths from the very beginning. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Supposing we had understood the gospel like this from the very beginning. You understand, you understand what I'm saying? I can't, I can't really say to you that, that if I was in a crusade, I wouldn't teach salvation like this. I would preach it like this. I would preach it as far as, as how God wants to save the soul. You know, that part, saving of the soul. And how he wants to, to save the soul. I wouldn't be so theological about it, you know. But I would, I would make sure that they understood because, see, in preaching it, in preaching the saving of the soul, in that I can show a man why he need God. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? I can show him why he needs God. Because I think one of the mistakes that the gospel, that preachers made, and this is why we were so disillusioned after we got saved, because they preached to us like God was almost like a Santa Claus. That, that, okay, my life is a mess, and so I need God to straighten out my life. But now, this, the real gospel says that after I get saved, I may enter into a mess. Some, <laughs> the, the real gospel says there's a, some suffering on this side. So if you preach to me from the perspective that everything's going to be hunky-dory and a flower bed of ease, because I done went through hell already. So you can't really, you, you, you know what I'm saying? I feel like I've been through hell already on the earth. That's what people, have, you know. So, so now they come to God looking for a change. They're looking for a change. They're looking for, they're looking for everything to be hunky-dory. And, and that's almost the way we present the gospel. We present it like 
you know, over here on this side, you know, you know, God going to do this, 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 and that all other. But that's not the promises that's in this book. Those promises are not in this book. What he preached, what he tells me is I'll be free from sin. That's the freedom and the liberty that he preaches in this book. He doesn't preach that, that my life is going to be so great. Supposing, supposing I get saved and then, glory to God, I do something for Christ and they lock me up for the rest of my life. Duh. I, look at all these Christians that are up on a mountain somewhere now, you know, starving and, and can't even get a drink of water. You, you, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of really God-fearing Christians there. You know, so I'm saying that what this message will do is it'll make us cautious from uh, and, and, and really cognizant and mindful of how we present the gospel. Because we can't present the gospel like it's a piece of candy anymore. Because it's not. Because there's suffering in the gospel. And Jesus did not see because we're afraid to preach like that. But Jesus was walking and a whole multitude of people were following him. In this 14th chapter of St. Luke, a bunch of folks were following him. And Jesus stopped and turned around and looked at him. And said, except you. Hate mama, daddy, sister, brother, husband, wife. You can't be my disciple. So some of them dropped off. Then he turned around again. He said, except you be willing to carry a cross, you cannot be my disciple. I'm sure a bunch of them left in. Then he said, except you hate your own life, you can't be my disciple. Now that's the gospel Jesus preached. Why are we afraid to preach that one? Huh? Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Glory to God. We got to preach what Jesus preached. Because we, because we, because see, when I got saved, when I got saved, I was I was so disillusioned because every I started suffering more then than I did before I got saved. I suffered so much till I went to God. I told God, I said, "Wait a minute, hold it, hold it. What is this?" And I'm out here preaching your gospel. I told the Lord, I said, "I'm out here preaching the gospel." I had more before I met you. I sure did. I told the Lord I had a whole lot more. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for, for just bearing, bearing, forbearing my ignorance. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for mercy, Lord. Amen. Because I didn't know I was going to suffer. And I, I was like chiding with God all the time. What is going on here? You called me to preach, but you ain't. Good, my God, I'm, I'm going to work. I told God I'm going to work. I remember when Tanya was in, in was she was in her in 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 twelfth grade, and I said I'm going to work. This you know, this 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 what this stuff is evangelism. It ain't working. <laughs> I'm going to get me a job, and I went and got me a job because she was she was she was going to graduate. You know how that stuff they have to have and all that stuff. And I said. This ain't working. And them, them twenty dollar love offers and all that stuff. No. <laughs> no. I got to go get me a job. <laughs> they got to hide my car and all that stuff. No, no, no. No, no, no. So I but see we were so disillusioned because we they they built they sold us a bill of goods and it wasn't real. It wasn't true. It wasn't the real God. It wasn't the real God and we thought that everything was gonna be hard. So so when, if a person is held captive by sin, he's a prisoner of the devil. He needs to know he can be free. A crack addict, if he want to be free of crack cocaine, he don't care about being rich. He just want to be free from crack cocaine. 
And I think that to preach the liberty of the spirit, the Holy Ghost, that's what I would preach in, in, a, in a conference. I would preach salvation the way the scripture call it. Now, when it comes down to, to really teaching, I'm talking about preaching, but when it comes down to teaching, yes, I would teach it in more detail because I can preach and show you what, that you need God and show you how to get to him. I can show you what God's going to do. If, if he save you, this is how he's going to save you. But I need to, like you said, I need to first let you know you need him and why you need him. But I can't, I can't, I can't present that need or show you that need as if he's going to solve all your little issues now. You know, you know he's going to pay your mortgage. He's going to turn your lights on and he's going to do all that. I can't preach God like that. I can't present him like that anymore. You may lose your house, your car, your friends, and everybody wants you to meet God. Amen. The Bible said men will hate you just for Christ's sake. I was in a I was in a in in a restaurant one day. I was in a restaurant when BT first started we didn't have nothing but this part right here. Well, that's all we had was this right here. And I was in a restaurant eating with Jeffro and Rachel Tompkins. <laughs> and 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 we got up from the table. And 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 we were walking and and Rachel saw some of her people that she had been in the church with for over 20 some years. And she spoke to them and they went They didn't even want to speak to her. Cuz she left that church. They thought she was in a cult. Because she left their church and was following that lady with that red hair. <laughs> Amen. You see, so you can be hated, you can be doing good, and people just despise you for, for, for you know, for whatever, whatever reasons. Jesus said they did it to him, they're going to do it to us. But shouldn't we preach that? I mean, if Jesus got a multitude of people, then he sure came here to save souls you know, to, to tell people about the gospel. And he's saying, you can't even be my disciple unless this, 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 and this. Why we can't preach like that? Because we think that Jesus will not be preferred if we tell the truth. We think men won't prefer him. But God gave us a word several years ago, and it said, truth is sufficient. Because no man can come to God except he drawn him anyhow. So you can tell the truth. Because if God drawn him, he coming. He coming. If God drawn him, he coming. And the truth is sufficient enough to bring him in. It's sufficient enough to bring him in. But will I preach this? Yes, I will. Because when I'm sitting here tonight, how old are you, Mayor? 18 years old. And she can tell me the gospel message. That's what I need. I need, I need these young people out there to know the gospel message. She can, she can tell me about the spirit, the, 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 the spirit of iniquity. She can tell me about circumcision of the flesh. She's been sitting here listening to it. It's necessary that we preach it the way Jesus did. And the way the disciples did. This is what they preach. This is what they preach. But I think her, her um, point is this. If if I had to if I had to witness to a sinner, somebody that don't know Jesus, the first thing I'm gonna deal with is that sinner's disposition. I don't need to deal with a lot of theology. I need to deal with that sinner's disposition. I need to bring him straight to the point you need God. You just need God. Because I know if I can get him to accept God, then then he'll know there's a change. If he, cause, cause there's gonna be a change if he accept God. So I just need to bring him to the point. You know what? The answer to your 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 life is Jesus. You need Jesus. You just need saving. If you were to get saved, your whole life would change. You'd turn around. The change. And so, because we know one thing is for sure, that once we receive Jesus Christ, whether we get a house, a car, a money, we don't get none of that stuff. We still prefer Jesus. Amen. We still prefer Jesus. Amen. So Jesus is sufficient. 
Just preach Jesus because, you, you know, and, 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 and let us not seek to get into debates about the soul and this and that. That ain't necessary right now. Just show a person a need for God. Show them that need for God. Show them why they need Jesus. You know, I was sitting in the church before I, before I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Um, I was sitting in the church up there in Baltimore, and, and, and uh, I had been in the church, coming to the church for about a year. And I, the first year, I, the first, when I first went into the church and went, went to the conference up in Baltimore, they were, these women marching around in white dresses. Y'all don't wear white no more, but we're going to start wearing white around here. Amen. These men were wa- marching around. You know, every now and then I get on that kick. <laughs> every, every now and then I go through that phase. I got to see some white around here. Glory to God. They were marching. It was a long church, a big, long church. And they were, I mean, it had to be 100 women in that line. And they was marching. They were singing this song by We Are the Holy Women of Highway. Holy women of highway. And I was sitting there. I wasn't saved. I was sitting there saying, when I come back up here, I'm going to be one of the women marching in white. The next year I came, I was one of the women marching in white. I was saved. When you sit in the church and you hear you, the word supposed to do something to you. That word, that word supposed to do something. That word is supposed to make you desire God. It, it just makes you desire God. I mean, it, it, it just starts doing something to you. But this word right here will make you desire him even more so. If the truth, when you start preaching the truth about salvation and sinners start sitting there, like, what? Because this word is, 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 when you preach it, even a sinner can understand it. Even, even a sinner can understand when, when, when he's sitting here just listening to it. He can understand it. Question? Yes, ma'am. I'm witnessing to somebody about salvation. I think one of the first things that need to be done, break down salvation, because some of them don't even know what you're talking about. That's true. Make sure that salvation is taught right. to the person that you're witnessing to, because they new to this, right. so they wonder what are you talking about? Right. And we need to be able to break it down where they can understand what salvation is. Now, 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 some people may think that that is um that 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 that's not real, but that is so true. What she said, you'd be surprised that people that don't know what you're talking about when you say they need to be saved. It, you know, when you tell people they need to be saved, some people don't know what. You, what are you talking about? I need to be saved. From what? <laughs> exactly. And, and then some people, some people don't realize that they have to have the Holy Ghost. They don't realize they have to have the Holy Ghost in order to be saved. They think that they can just receive, receive, repeat a prayer, prayer or that, you know, a lot of people think that they say because they get baptized. When, when they get baptized in that water, they think that they're saved. Because I ask people, I've asked people, are you saved? Oh, yeah, I was baptized since such a time. And they really equate that with salvation so she's right you have to really tell people what salvation really is salvation is preach that message peter preached on the day of pentecost there's a question came in wait a minute hold on just a minute let me see a question came in online conscious soul bears witness in the holy ghost romans 9 and 1 the conscience bears witness in the holy ghost Okay, that's the that's an answer for those people that was asking about the conscience just a while ago. When the dead man was thrown on the prophet's bones, what brought him alive? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought him alive because he was anointed. Elijah was anointed. He was anointed. Even after death, his bones were anointed. Glory to God. That, that's some power. He wanted a double portion. He got it. He, he was working miracles after he died. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Whoa. Oh, Elijah, Lord. It's going to be good to just sit down and talk with Elijah. And, and I want to talk to both of them. I do. I want to talk to both of them. 
But you know what? They, 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 if they were, you know, back there then, they kind of envy us because we got it. We got the, we, 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 we received the promise. They had it upon them. They had it upon them. We have them in us. Amen. Question. Yes. Yes, Sister Peterson. Yes. Like you was just saying about uh, when most of the peoples, when they, you're talking to them about salvation, and they tell you that, because I have a 100-year-old lady. <laughs> I've been talking to her forever, it seemed like. And I asked her about her salvation. I explained to her about salvation, that she need to have Jesus Christ as her personal Savior, what he did for her. She said when she was in Catholic Church, they taught him that. But they believe that, and I don't care what I say to her, she go right back there, that they, she was baptized. So she believes she's saved. Mm -hmm. Now, she's 100 years old. Lord Jesus. And she haven't received a Holy Spirit yet. Well, at least I don't, well, I'm going to say I don't know what she don't receive because you talk to her, but that's what she say all the time. So you think her conscience, do she really know that she belonged to God because she t believe it, she received uh, God because of the baptism? Well, I think that, that a lot of people believe that because that's all they've been taught. Mm -hmm. You know, if you grow up in something and that's all you know, you know, I, I could see where she really believes that. Yeah. Because she really believes it. I don't care which way I go, she take me right back there. Exactly. So, so I, the only uh -huh. thing that you can do is pray for God to break that yoke. Oh, then, God yeah, got to destroy that yoke mm -hmm. because that's a yoke. She's wow. yoked to that, that's that, to that belief. God has to destroy that. Okay, pray for the yoke. But don't give up on her. Keep mm -hmm. talking to her about Jesus. Yeah, I Keep do. talking to her about Jesus. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Okay. You had a question on the floor Sunday. I wanted to ask you about this question, but I don't know. Um, you. It was Lisa said, the, she asked you this. Uh, when a soul died, that, that's what I understood. When a, when a person died without the Holy Spirit... Do they have a body? Do they receive a body? That's what I want to know. Do they receive a body and that's how they feel? That <laughs> I know you say that God is able to destroy the soul in the body. But I still want to know. <laughs> um, I believe so because the scripture says that at the resurrection of the dead, is he going to give up his dead? Well, you want to know what body they come up in. Yeah, because we receive a body when well, we... Well, the reason I say I think they have this, the same body, the, the wicked dead. Right. The wicked dead. The reason I say that is because the scripture says it's better for a man to be thrown in the hell, to, to go to heaven with one arm than to be thrown in the hell with two. Okay, so you had a body. Those people, the, the, yeah, I, I believe that whatever they got, okay. well, whether it be their natural body or some type of spiritual body or their soul is considered some type of body or whatever, it's going to be tormented. And another reason why I feel like they had a body is because the scripture says that in hell there's a skin worm. It says the skin worm never dies. So it's, it sounds as if somebody's in hell going to have some skin on them. So all I know is I don't want to find out. I don't want to know. I don't want to know that bad. I don't want to find out. I don't want to experience it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to experience it. Yeah. They don't, they don't, they don't, um, we the one gets a new body. We get a new body. But I, I, when I read that scripture long years ago that said the skin worm never dieth, that's what it says. It says in hell the skin worm never dieth. And there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So he got some teeth. <laughs> Glory to God. Yes. These are the things you got to look forward to. If you don't accept Christ now, you, you won't stand before God in peace. You know, so you're going to, they got to realize, like, 
when you burn some, if you stick your finger in the fire, you feel it. Just imagine your body be burnt for eternity. There is no way out. So you need to know, let them know you're going to be burning and you're going to feel everything. Well, when, I, when the Lord took me to hell, when the Lord took me into hell, the people I saw had bodies. And because um, I saw some people there that I, that I knew. And they, 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 were, they had bodies. And, um, and then when I went, when I went as a um, sinner, when the God took me into hell, when I went in, when I was cast into hell, um, you could feel, I could feel the, oh Jesus, I could feel my my skin blistering from the. It's like I was cooking, like I was being cooked, just like a chicken is cooked in a rotisserie. That's the nearest I can explain it. You know, like a, when you l- w- looking through that glass and see that chicken turning, and then he starts to blister, and you know, and he getting darker and darker. That's how that's how my skin was. I could see the blisters coming up on it, and and I could feel. Oh Lord, I don't want to talk about that. But anyway, glory to God. That's not. It, it, somebody got some skin down there. And different things. She also said what she saw is the skin's melting off and coming back on and melting off and coming back on. And also the skin worm. So she spoke a lot about the scriptures and said they are so real. They're literal. Same thing. Ooh. I don't like to even think about it. But one thing is, is, is um, that we need to consider is that hell is going to be cast into the lake. That everything that's in hell is going into the lake of fire. And now what that scripture says is that they're tormented forever and ever. It's not like you go into the lake. You would think if you go into a lake of fire, you're just going to burn up. But the scripture says that when the Antichrist and and the devil, when the devil is cast into the, to the lake of fire, it says he's cast into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented forever and ever. And the smoke shall descend up before the nostrils of the saints forever. We'll be able to look over in there and see. We'll be, there's, there's, hell is just terrible. Lake of fire, oh, Lord. It's forever. See, see, the thing about being lost, you never be found no more. You can't, there's no way out. You're not coming out. It's over. Someone said to me the other day, said, I came out of the house because, you know, I had been sick for two weeks. And I came out of the house, and I said, boy, it's hot out here. And I said, boy, I can't hardly handle this heat. I know I, I couldn't handle hell. Say that. And, and so this person that was walking with me said, Doc, you really, you really think a lot about hell, don't you? I said, I sure do. Every day, every minute of the day is forever before me. <laughs> Amen. And it needs to be before us. We need to remind ourselves, don't go to hell. No matter what happened, you don't go to hell. No matter what you got to do, don't go to hell. What you got to give up, don't go to hell. Give it up. There's nothing in this world worth going to hell for. Absolutely nothing. You can't even imagine the torment of hell. You can't imagine what it would be like to be boiling in a lake of fire for eternity, separated from God for eternity. No reprieval, no, no way out. Here's this rich man talking about, tell Larry to go dip his finger in a pool of water just so one drop can touch my tongue. Just one drop of water, and you'll never have that drop of water. And you'll never be able to sit at peace in hell you'll never be able to you know you just sit down and go there's no sigh of relief in hell I know I've been there there's no sigh of relief none you cannot sit down you know like you've been tired and you want to sit you can't just sit and go you can't do that there's no sigh of relief none none question yes ma'am 
I want you to explain this question to me because I was under the impression that we all was going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We all were going to get new bodies. We but, are. But the ones that that is not of God, we're going to spend eternity in our new body with the Father. And the ones that, that is of Satan, their father, they're going to spend eternity with him, but we all going to have bodies. No, ma'am. not no. They're not getting that new body that we get. Okay, that's why I want you to explain that to me. No, ma'am. They're not getting the body we get. Okay. They're they not getting that new body we get. Okay. That body is only, only the, you have to have the seed in you to inherit that body. The seed is the Holy Ghost. But now the, the wicked, the wicked, I don't know what that... I don't know whether they're coming up in the same body that they had before. I don't. I, I really don't know. I can tell you. I kind of think they are because they said they're going to have skin worms and gnashing of teeth and all of that kinds of stuff. So they got to have a body with skin on it uh, for there to be a skin worm in hell. But not not like us. They won't have bodies like ours. No. Because mm -mm. see, our bodies, the, the change that you're talking about, the new body, is incorruptible. It's incorruptible. Mm -hmm. Right. The doc, this question been following me a long time, and now is my opportunity. When a person die in sin, and they burn their bodies, like at the funeral, they don't cremation. Put them in, yep. When they cremate them, okay. When 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 the ashes and stuff, like after everything is over, what what happened to the the ashes when you know, like they say the the, the they got to give up. They got to give up the uh, the ghosts and all of that. What happened to the ashes if when they burn their bodies? Cause I had a loved one didn't want to, don't want to be burned. They don't want to be burned, but they not living for God. But they don't want to be burned. They want to. They think they finna come back and you know they they fool. I can't hardly get them straightened out. But they. <laughs> what happened to the ashes? Well. It, the same thing that happens when you die, you, we got saints that have died, and if you go right there now and dig up that body, it's nothing but dust. It's nothing but dust now. So, you know, that's the same as being cremated, I would think, because the, the body has gone back to, to dust. The scripture says the body will go back to the dust. Even if you don't cremate it, it's going back to dust and ashes. So I don't think it really makes a difference. I know it doesn't make a difference for us, for us as saints, because that, that's not our body, no way. That's not the one we're going to have anyway. Doc, you made the comment earlier, um, or I think or Tanya made it, um, about you know how this ministry, how, how when you teach, you know, and you how you have to teach this. A lot of ministers not teaching this word. You know, like I was, you have to have nothing. You have to want nothing to teach this word. Yeah. Because you can look at the guys that that want something from people. They're not going. They're not. If I want something from you, I'm not going to tell you what you're doing wrong to me because I'm trying to get something out of you. That's right. And and that's 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 something that's unheard of in a lot of places. And we have to stay right there. We have to just, like you said, tell people the flat footed truth. Mm hmm. Because a lot of people, we have friends around us and people that associate us, and sometimes we go lightly, especially, especially we find that in our family because we don't want to offend our family. But they're going to hell if we don't. Mm -hmm. Right? You, we need to tell our family, you need Jesus. Amen. From mama to sister, but do it in a loving way, but mm -hmm. we got to tell them that. Because some of their action, and then we, cause we're going to have to give... We gonna have to give account for this. That's real. This person been right, right next to you. You say you love this person. It's your brother right here, your sister right been next to you all this time. And you ain't never confront what's in there. I had that happen to me recently. I was, I came out of um, World Conference. I was, I mean, just tired. And then I went on vacation. And normally when I go on vacation, I rest for two or three days, just sleep. I sleep for two or three days and then get up and go to the theme parks with the kids and stuff. Well, this time, I didn't rest. I didn't sleep. And so uh, that's what got me sick because I, I took right off after the World Conference, right into the parks and all that stuff with those kids. 
And so when I came, when I when it was over that Sunday, I was about to pass out. I was just about to pass out. But one of my loved ones was was had had some something going on that was kind of crucial, and I knew nobody would be there. And they needed some support. So uh, the Lord, I said, well, I need to go. I need to go. And then I said, Lord, I'm just dead tired. I can't go. I can't. I'm just tired. And the Lord said, go. And I pushed myself, and I went. Uh, Charlene took me. And when I got there, the same, what you said, came upon me. I said, now the Lord told me to come here. Now the Lord don't want me here for naught. And so I began to minister to that loved one. You need Jesus. You need to run back to Jesus. You know, and that's how, that's the boldness that we got to have with this word. We got to be able to tell people. We, you know, there are people that are going to accuse us before God. There are people that are going to say, they didn't tell me. You know, people are going to look at us and say, why didn't you tell me? You know, you were my next door neighbor and you never told me about salvation. You worked with me every day on the same job. We sat right next to each other and you never mentioned salvation to me. There are a lot of people are going to be accusing us of that. People that we are ashamed to mention Jesus to. We are ashamed to, to say, are you saved? You know, I, well, the Lord convicted me of that on the airplane. Now, see, that's a federal place, and you're not really supposed to intrude, you know, on that. But so what I do, I, have, I always carry a study guide, or I usually carry Be Ye Perfect or Thought War now, I ca especially Thought War. I carry thought war, and I just kind of have it where they, they can see it, you know. S try to use that as something to, to get a conversation going, you, you know. And if they start talking, you know, about it, then now I'm not violating any federal regulations, you know, bringing my religion onto a federal, you know, thing. Uh, so um, I use that. We got to be wise now. And we got, to, we got to be intentional. We have to be intentional. I intentionally carry my book with me. I intentionally do it so that yeah, maybe I can use this to strike up a conversation piece or something, you know. So um, we, we got to be bold because people will be able to accuse us and say, you never told me. Why didn't you, why didn't you tell me? Now I'm lost and I'm on my way to hell and you never told me. You never mentioned this to me. Any question? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Banks, I just wanted to ask um, for us, um, would this be good for us to marry this message with the thought war? Because when we're talking about ministering to um, unbelievers and, and you know people that are sinful, like when, when we take the, the course, the thought war course, it talks about, it brings us to the state of um, the fall and what happened and um, and I see this when I say marry it doc I meant to that uh, part of the positional change inside of thought war mm -hmm. and I see this as a great increase mm -hmm. to the positional change because it really like shines that great light on everything mm -hmm. and I think if we as um, you know us Bible teachers if we go and look at that course inside of coming from the fall to the positional change, and we, I think that'll be a, be good inside of ministry. I, I think that with thought war, what what we have to remember is that what what is the purpose of thought war? You know, the the book thought war, the course thought war. Um, thought war shows us what we are if we are not in the spirit, if we don't walk in the spirit. That's what it does. It shows us. Uh, because saints of God shouldn't be battling meanness and, you know, uh, um, um, jealousy and all of those kinds of things that Thawar talks about. Uh, so it, it's really there to show us this is how we operate when, we're, when we don't walk after the Spirit, that we're outside of the boundaries of the faith. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, sir. That was awesome what you said about 
um, when you was on how when you go on the plane and you have your different books. It just thought um, brought back to my memory when, cause me and um, Coach Alls, we work for the school board, and he's in IS. He's over eternal suspension, and we we go in there in the morning and we put on BTBN. You and, and we, who? Me and Coach Alls. Oh. Um, Trey's okay. husband. Okay. And we put on BTBN, mm-hmm. and we'll turn it up. Oh, BTBN. So you, oh, yeah. yeah. So now you got thousands of kids going in here yeah. yearly. And every time they go in there, they just, how they react, they all quiet and listening. Pastor Belinda, Pastor um, Tanya, you, Where, where are you Mike, coaching at? Where you? Um, Coconut Creek High School. You can play BTV in it? Oh, we do it. Oh. I mean, because okay. that's his office. Okay. That's his office. That's his office. That's his okay. office. Mm-hmm. Not in all. No, nah, that's his office. Uh-huh. And when we but go, when they come in, there. when they come in, there, they hear <laughs> they hear it all day long from seven thirty in the morning to two forty five in God the afternoon. So when and then they have the questions. <laughs> I love it. So with the, with the question that gives us they they kids they don't they. Some of them um, Jehovah Witnesses. Mm-hmm. Some of them believe in different gods. Mm-hmm. And just hearing Pastor Pam, Pastor Tanya, Pastor Belinda, you, Mike, they feel convicted. My they Lord. have a lot of questions, and we get questions after questions wow. after questions after questions. And that gives us a lot of room to minister to those because they, ha- they, they lost, and they'll tell you, hey, coach, what does she mean by this? Or Why? what is she saying? Wow. So you mean to tell me if I receive Jesus, this can happen? Or if just knowing Jesus, this? And we like, man, we say, you know what? Keep listening until it go on quick. Because sometimes you have your little breaks. Yeah. So we say keep listening. And when we go, when she go on a break, then we'll explain. Uh-huh. But just by doing that, like you said, we have to be wise. Yes. You know, but just by being wise like that, that's giving those children an opportunity to know Christ. Even... Outside of IS, they still, hey, Coach Paul, what is she talking about about this? Uh That gives us another gate to minister the gospel. But like you said, we have to know who we are. And just by standing for righteousness, we cannot be ashamed to tell the truth about the gospel. Because that's what the kids, that's what the adults, that's what this world needs to hear now. Mm -hmm. And we can't be so ashamed and scared to let the people know about God. My Jesus. Jesus, Lord. Um, um, I was the Lord. I was just listening to the Lord as He was speaking. Uh, Tanya, you can you can. Um, I was I was I I was I used to be years and years and years ago. Similar to I had a similar mindset to you. Um, relative to my role in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I had no idea. I had no idea that I would be doing what I'm doing now. And that the lives that have been touched by this ministry, I had no idea that God would expand this ministry to touch so many lives. Don't ever underestimate the power of God in your own life. Now, if I had not been sitting here, I wouldn't, to hear, I would never have known that some kids at Coconut Creek High School are listening to a television network that God used us to start down in Jamaica. I would never have known that, that there are so many lives that are being touched by this word. Don't ever underestimate the power of God in you. Because God is able to multiply himself through you. And you don't know. I mean, look where we've come from. 
you know, and I mean, from this little bitty purple church here, right in here, to all of these different locations, and 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 now the television network, and and now you're telling me that the television network, it's kids from high school are asking questions about stuff that's being played on television network. Well, see, th- th- see that that where where sin abound, grace does much more abound. Praise you, Jesus. That's just God now bringing light where the darkness is. That's what He does. That's what God does. And so when so I used to I used to think well, you know I used to be very 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 uh, nonchalant about certain things, and God said that's an insult to me. That's an insult. So when I when I, there are things that I'm hearing people say now, I got people all up in Timbuktu that 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 contact us, that live by every archive. That's what they live on. They live by the archives. They don't have a BT, but the archives is their lifeline. That's their life, you know. And we and we take things like that for granted. I mean, because we're, you know. We're, we're getting fat on it. One thing I want to say before I go, saints, and I'm, I'm supposed to be leaving Friday. Jamaica's so glad to hear me say that. Amen. I'm supposed to be leaving Friday, but one thing I want to say, and that is this, to whom much is given, much is required. And you, it's, it's time now for each and every one of us to judge ourselves to see if we be in the faith. Because this is no good if you're not in the faith. It's no good to you. And being in the faith don't mean I come to church. Being in the faith means that I am holy every day of the week. I'm holy every moment of the day. That's being in the faith. And, and I've learned not to lie to me. I'm not going to lie to me. If I'm off, I'm going to say, you know what, Mary Banks, you better get yourself together. You, you, you mess around and die, you're going to hell. You know, you need to get yourself together. God don't like that. We got to be honest with ourselves. We got to be honest with ourselves, saints. And nobody is exempted. Nobody. God wants every one of us. He doesn't care how much we've accomplished. He don't care if you got 10,000 churches. He don't care if you ain't holy. All of us got to go the same route. All of us got to go the same route. It's going to take the same thing for the small and the great to get to heaven. Same thing. And if we don't love the way the scriptures say love, we don't love one another, that's your test. That's, That's what you judge. Do you love people? Do you love people? If you don't love people and you're not willing to lay down your life for people, you ain't in the faith. I'm sorry, but you're not in the faith because Jesus is the same in all of us. He doesn't change. He's the same in all of us. And he laid down his life for sinners. And we should be willing to love sinners, people that are sinners. And when we hear ourselves being judgmental and super critical of people, we need to say, I'm not in the spirit. I'm God not pleased with that. He's not pleased with that. When we when we when we judge people, you know, we sit in judgment of people. We so quick to judge and and and, and quick to criticize or quick to you know you gotta say God God not pleased with that. God is not pleased with that. And 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 um, bitterness is a spirit, and you can't hide it long. Sooner or later, God will let something come up for that bitterness. To, to, you'll hear it in your in your conversation. You'll hear it in your conversation. Bitterness, judgmentalism. You got to start listening for that kind of stuff. You know what I do now? 
I'm slow to speak. I'm slow to speak. People, sometimes I'm in conversation with people and I, I let them talk. I let them talk. And I'm slow to speak. I'm slow to speak. You know why? Because I'm judging what I'm going to say. And I'm judging the spirit I'm going to say it in. And I'm judging whether I even need to say it. So I don't, some things I don't even say anymore. Some things I don't address. Sometimes it's best to just be quiet. So T, you've been telling me that a long time. Sometimes just, just time to just shut your mouth. Yeah, she's right. And sometimes you just need to hush. Don't talk so much. Amen. Sometimes we need to just stop and consider what we're going to say before we say it, and even if we should say it. We got to judge, why are you going to say this? Why am I going to say that? What, what, is, what good is it going to serve? If it's not going to edify, then what good does it do for me to say it? If it's not going to build up, it's going to tear down. So it may not even be good for me to even say it. So I'm slow to speak now because I'm trying to get to heaven. I'm judging how I feel about everything and everybody because I want to get to heaven. I don't want anything in my heart. I don't want anything, any impediments. I want to be where I can lay there and talk to God. Me and him just had a good time last night. We just, just lay there, just talk to God, just talk to him. He's just talking back and I'm just talking, just listening. I don't want nothing blocking me from my God. So let's be careful. And, and, and ministers, let me tell you something. In this ministry, I'm looking around in here and I see some vets. I see uh, Gloria and them and Ned and them and you know, T and Ella and all of them. Some of y'all been here a long time. And I want you to consider why you stayed. Why are you here? Because one thing about Mary Banks, that I used to get criticized for this a lot, and that was confrontation. I'm very confrontational. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost is a confronting spirit. There will never, you will never read anywhere in the New Covenant where Jesus Christ was in the presence of sin and didn't address it. You will not read it. If sin was in his presence, he addressed it. And he didn't care who's, who, who the sin was in. It could have been one of his disciples. It could have been the Pharisees. He was going to deal with it. And Jesus was my teacher. Jesus taught me ministry. Leaders, you have to be confrontational. When God, and I'm saying this before your membership, when God put people in a church, it is not so that they can be comfortable. The church is not a social club. The church is a place where people come to find out where they stand with God. And they come to re receive instructions as to how to serve him. And if there are people that are, that are here that you know they're not in the right place with God, sit them down and say, look, you're not in the right place with God. And if you die today, you're going to hell. Simple as that. If that's the case, you're going to have to be confrontational. Sometimes that's all it takes to get a person, to, to rattle a person and say, well, you, you know. But if we sit here because they don't rock the boat, you know, and they just, and don't say anything to them. So, well, I ain't going to bother these people. See, because I can look around in here, and there's some people that are standing on thin ice with God. They're on thin ice with God. And if that ice crack, they don't have nothing to hold on to. Because you come to church and because you're 
in right standing with the membership and all of that stuff doesn't mean that you're fit for heaven. Doesn't mean that if you die, you're going to heaven. You got to have holiness inside. And we as ministers, y'all ministers, you got to, that's, this, is, this is the vineyard. See, God said he give pastors after his own heart. So members, sheep, if you sheep, you're going to have to bear confrontation. Because this word now is separating the sheep from the goats. And the goats going to start really standing out. The goats going to stand out like a sore thumb, even more so now. And so in the, when the shepherd comes and say, look, you're not acting like a sheep, you're acting like a goat. You know, when that shepherd comes, don't, don't get offended, just get right. Just get right. If that shepherd comes and say, your disposition is not of God, your mindset is not of God, the way you think is not of God, that's not God. I don't care how you feel about yourself, honey. If God send the shepherd to tell you that what you're doing and what you're thinking and how you feel and how you relate to issues is not of God, then grab a hold of that. Because that's God now warning you. That's God warning. That's God warning. The, the best thing that ever happened to me was when God confronted me. God confronted me in church and let me know right in front of a whole conglomerate of people that I was on my way to hell. That was the best thing ever happened to me. And you as leaders and, 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 and intercessors and prophets and prophetess, you all have a responsibility to the flock. You're not here to babysit. You're here to raise the people of God, to raise them in holiness. And when you see that which is not holy, you got to address it. You got to say that right there is not holy. They have to do that. They have to do that. Whether you get angry offended, mad, whatever. The truth, if you get mad and leave, go out that door, the truth going with you. We, 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 we're okay. We're okay if you get offended and, uh, you know, and get mad and say, well, I ain't coming back. Well, okay, that's fine, as long as it, we know the truth went with you. Because the truth can do what we can't do. As long as we know that the truth went with you. I don't want to stand before God and God says, I dishonored my gift. I want to make sure I make full use of the gift. You know why? Because we're supposed to be a family that's all trying to get to heaven. Isn't that the bottom line? All of us are supposed to be trying to get to heaven and leaders got a responsibility to the flock. Leaders got a responsibility to, to tell the sheep, get from over there. You eating off the, you, you aren't supposed to be over there eating. This is your, this your pasture right here. You eat over here in this, in this field. Get rid of that right there. Get off that television. Cut off this radio station. Whatever. You know, whatever it is, you got to be willing to do that. And you, you want to call it control or whatever you want to call it, I call it holiness. I call it Holiness. We're trying to get to heaven, saints. Amen? Praise the Lord. Lastly, there's something that we, I want to do uh, that, you know, I want you guys to get involved in. We want to start, we want to take these study guides and we want to start reading them and putting them on BTBN. So I need some volunteers that want to read on camera. I think you'd be great. Ed, <laughs> I think you'd be so great just reading, reading, reading some of our works on, on, on camera. Blake, you're filming, won't you? Amen. Yes, yes. We want to start reading some of these study guys. Who else want to want to read? Praise the Lord. You want to read? <laughs> Somebody else want to read? Tanya, I know you're going to read. Rick, you want to read? Oh. Oh. 
Miss Tanya, you want to read? Just read the study guides on TV. Because we're going to put up the graphics and stuff. But we just need the voice. We just need you to read it. No, you don't have to stand. Just sitting. Just sitting, reading, like reading a chapter at a time. No, he's going to film you. He's going to film you sitting, sitting down reading. Because we're going we're gonna to break it up into 10-minute segments. But, yes, ma'am. You'll read too? Okay, cool. All right. That's two. So um, I, need, I, need, I need somebody to write these names down to people. That's Charlotte, these two, they're going to read. Anybody else want to volunteer to be reading on camera? Okay, Miss Karen Shatville. All right. Amen. Heather, I need you to read. Pam, I need you to read. I mean, this is a we we need we don't need we need some we need some tokens. Y'all the tokens. <laughs> We got to have our token white people. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, seriously, though, I think, Pam, you, does, you do a very good job of reading. And Heather, I know. And, 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 and we want you to read. And, and if you need to come in a little bit some, at certain places and stuff like that, because I know you're able to do that. And I, know, and I want Heather's personality. I want to capture her personality. She, you know, you, you know, y'all know that, that personality Heather, Heather got? She got that matter of fact personality, you know, like, like, hey, man, this is it, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. Don't you get it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she got that personality. And that's, you, that's that freshness that you need. You know, we want that on BTBN. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tanya Thomas. <laughs> praise the Lord. I guess we'll be reading. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Saints, have you been blessed? Amen. Have you been blessed? Amen. Come on, let's give God praise. It's awesome. Amen. Those of you online, thank you for being with us tonight. We pray that you've been blessed as well. Amen. We're going to um, prepare to give in our offering. I want to know our young people, Asiana and Kirsten and... Um, Nico and Kia, are, are you all understanding the message? You all understand? Asiana, look at Asiana. <laughs> they was telling me how they really enjoyed conference. The young, mm-hmm. Yeah, they really enjoyed conference this year. Amen. Because we, Kirsten, nineteen, is going to be a cop. <laughs> she wants to be a cop. Little shouty. <laughs> I say, how old are you now? 17. Janae, 16. They growing on up. Yeah, growing on up, I tell you. All right. God is good. Amen. Sarah, you finished school, right? Mary, Mary, you finished? Oh, child. Yeah, huh, Sarah looked just alike. Zach is older than you? You're, you're, oh, you, you're in college. I child went back to high school. Now I know you're older than Zach. Okay. You know, Zach finished school. He's, this year he started in college. Wow. <laughs> so, Don, all of your kids are grown now. You're free, huh? <laughs> Zach's Zach still a baby. Yeah, Zach is actually what? He's 16. He's graduated. He's in college, but he's actually, he's just 16. That's right. He's, he ain't grown. You said he ain't grown yet. He's in college? Mm-hmm. He's starting college this year. Oh, wow. Well, you know, Jamaica, they graduate before. Yeah. Yeah. So Zach is 16 and in college. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, God. Praise the Lord. Saints, raise your hand for your tithe and love offering envelopes. Let's take our offering tonight. And Tiara graduated this year, guys. I think last week. 